from the authors of Author Masterminds. This is Mysterious. Mystery surrounds us every day. Join us and listen to true stories of mystery, from human behavior to nature and the physical environment to paranormal experiences. The stories are true, even if we can't explain them. Welcome to Mysterious. My name is Stephen Levi, the master of the impossible crime, and I will be your host for this episode. I also write about Alaska history, and the following story is one of the strangest I've ever uncovered. No saga of the Alaska Gold Rush would be complete without a touch of the mysterious. Every rush has its eerie events, and the Alaska Gold Rush was no exception. Perhaps the most perplexing incident of that era was the saga of the Claire, Nevada. Here was a tale of greed, robbery, and murder, along with a ghostly revisitation. But it was more than that. It was also one of the largest successful robberies in American history, combined with the third largest mass murder in American history surpassed only by the Oklahoma City bombing in 1995 and the 9-11 attack on the World Trade Center in September of 2001. Hardly noteworthy in life, in death the Clara Nevada has become immortal. She was built in 1872 as a survey vessel for the United States Coast Guard and Geodetic Survey, the USGS. Originally named the Hassler in honor of Ferdinand Hassler, who was the first superintendent of the USGS, the ship plied the waters of Alaska surveying the coastline for more than two decades. Then, when her usefulness was extinguished, she was condemned. In the normal course of events, she would have been reduced to scrap, recycled, and placed into another steamship. But in 1897, gold had been discovered along the Klondike River, and before the Hassler could be destroyed, she was purchased for $15,700 by the Pacific and Alaska Transportation Company. Based in Portland, the Pacific and Alaska Transportation Company was one of the many rapidly forming companies that were taking advantage of the sudden demand of transportation to the gold fields. Marine transportation between the Pacific Northwest and the twin cities of Skagway and Daia at the top of the Lynn Canal was the perfect business opportunity for entrepreneurs with ice water in their veins. Passengers going north were those who could afford to pay for their passage in cash. Coming south, the cargo would be Argonauts returning home laden with tens of thousands of dollars in gold dust and nuggets. Men and women who could pay for their passage in cash. If they couldn't pay, they couldn't get on board. As the owners of the Pacific and Alaska Transportation Company viewed it, their ships would be filled both ways with customers paying cash. The mating voyage of the Claire Nevada was not fated to be without incident. She collided with a revenue cutter Grant as she was backing out of her berth in Seattle, and upon arrival in Port Townsend the next day, she rammed the dock and damaged her bowsprit. It was on her return south, however, that placed her in the history books. Leaving Daia on February 5, 1898, on a proverbial dark and stormy night, she headed south into the Lynn Canal. What happens next is a matter of speculation. A witness on a wharf at Seward City, now named Comet, related that he had seen a ship on fire near Eldred Rock, now a lighthouse, and suddenly there had been a massive orange fireball on the water. Then all went black. He assumed that a ship had exploded. There was a gale of near-hurricane force blasting down Lynn Canal that night, and therefore it was impossible for any craft to get reach the site of the fireball. A week later, the steamer Rustler of Juno reported a wreck on the reef off Eldred Rock. As only the spars could be seen above the water at low tide, there was no way to positively identify the wreck. The Rustler later recovered one body, identified as that of the Claire Nevada's purser George Foster Beck. The identification of the body, combined with the fact that the Claire Nevada never made port, led officials to the conclusion that the wreck in the shallow waters off Eldred Rock was that of the Claire Nevada. No one knew for sure how many people had perished in the disaster. In the wreck report, the president of the Pacific and Alaska Transportation Company stated he had 
no knowledge of who was on board, as the passenger list had gone down with the ship. This was not, it should be added, very unusual. This was the beginning of a gold rush, and the emphasis was on making money, not keeping records. Estimates of the dead ran from a low of 65 to a high of 165. It didn't take long for recriminations to begin. Federal investigators re-examined the collision between the Clara Nevada and the United States Revenue Cutter Grant. While at the time the accident was considered no more than an embarrassment to the captain on his maiden voyage. And later, after the Clara Nevada was wrecked, it was assumed that it was proof positive of the captain's incompetence. It was also revealed that the engine room telegraph cable had been inoperable prior to the incident and that communication wires had been broken and probably not repaired prior to the incident at the Port Townsend dock. Travelers who had taken passage on the vessel between Seattle and Alaska, the trip before the ship went down, were questioned and many of them did not have very kind words for either the ship or the crew. Many claimed the crew was incompetent, intoxicated, or both, and the ship was clearly unseaworthy. One of the passengers, Charles Jones of the Dalles, reported that, I was afraid the Clara Nevada would be wrecked from the time she left Seattle until Skagway was reached. We smashed into the Revenue Cutter Grant when we were backing out of Yesler's dock. We rammed into almost every wharf at which we tried to land. We blew out three boiler flues. We floundered around in rough water until all the passengers were scared to death. We witnessed intoxication among the officers and heard them cursing at each other until it was personally sickening. The Clara Nevada also became the cornerstone of a political battle as well. The vitriolic Colonel Alden J. Blethen of the Seattle Times, then a populist newsprint, tried to use the Clara Nevada incident to attack the Steamboat Inspection Service as a means of embarrassing the Republican administration of the governor of Washington. Though his attack was politically motivated, his facts were accurate. Many in the shipping business were tarnishing the good name of Seattle, as Blethen had charged, and now the city was acquiring a reputation as a haven for decrepit and unsafe ships, and businessmen who were more interested in profit than human lives. The flood of humanity to the gold fields seemed to bring out the wolf in some maritime companies, and more disasters were destined to follow the Clara Nevada. The New York Times clearly felt the same way when it editorialized that the Clara Nevada incident simply emphasized the conditions that prevailed in northern waters. Ships of all sorts and conditions are being pressed into the service to carry crowds to the gold fields. Charges produced countercharges which generated further insinuations of misconduct and incompetence. On March 5th, the Seattle Times went so far as to attack the steamboat inspector, saying that, quote, they should decorate the end of an elevated rope, unquote. Since witnesses had related seeing a fireball, it was generally assumed that dynamite was being transported with passengers, a clear violation of both good sense and maritime law. The controversy only ended in August of 1898 when the conclusion was reached that the Clare Nevada had caught fire and during the frantic fight to keep the flames from the place which stored the dynamite and powder, the officers lost their bearing and incidentally control of the ship. The storm drove the vessel up onto the reef of Eldred Rock, broadside on, where the ship split open. The primary evidence for the fire theory was that the fire hoses had been found on the sunken ship's deck, and the hoses had been attached to the hydrants and coupled to the pumps. Let me take a short break. Mysterious Podcast is sponsored by Author Masterminds and Readers and Writers Book Club. We invite you to join the club where you can chat with author masterminds, read free content pieces and serialized books, and you can buy books at 50% off the list price. Please check Mysterious Show Notes for links to the book club and author masterminds. As the flow of Argonauts going north grew from a trickle to a river to a flood, the number of maritime sinkings rose. By the end of 1898, 16 ships had gone to the bottom of the inside passage. Then the recriminations finally faded, and the Clara Nevada became just another ship lost at sea. It appeared that the book was finally closed on the disaster. But what was singular about the Clara Nevada was not so much the ship's death, but its revivication. 
Ten years later, almost to the day, another hurricane force boiled the waters of Lynn Canal. Ships scattered for cover in the bays and bights, and on Eldred Rock, the lighthouse keeper could feel the earth shifting beneath the tower. Although it was almost brand new, built in 1902, the structure shook violently. All night long, the wind screamed as it powered its way south. Waves rose to staggering heights and threatened to sweep over the small island. It was not until morning that the wind died and the waves settled. Only then did the lighthouse keeper bench outside. What a sight he saw! There, on a pinnacle off the northern end of the island, was the Clara Nevada, high and dry, while the bones of her late passengers and crew were scattered on the beach. The storm had dragged the boat from its watery grave, and the next night, the storm took the ship back. But the story of the Clara Nevada continued, and Alice in Wonderland would have said, curiouser and curiouser. Scrambling the chronology, in June of 1916, 18 years after the Clara Nevada had gone down, Alaskan hard hat diver C.F. Stagger spent two days on the wreck. In addition to cutting and farming the kelp that had entombed the vessel, he salvaged about half a ton of copper and brass. Though he could not make it below decks, he was positive from the examination made that the vessel had not caught on fire as was previously supposed, and the wreck had been caused by something else, possibly a large submerged rock. It is also interesting to note that the wrecker's conclusion contradicted that of witnesses who swore they saw a fireball. Careful examination of the fireball theory, however, revealed some other flaws. While it would be reasonable for the ship to be transporting dynamite north to the boom town, it is hard to believe that dynamite would be shipped south to Seattle. If all mining equipment brought high prices in the gold country, why was dynamite being transported south? Further, if there was as much as 15 tons of dynamite on board, why didn't the ship completely disintegrate when the explosion went off? And if the dynamite had been the cause of the ship's demise, why was the hole in the Clara Nevada's hull found in the area of the boiler room and not the cargo hold? In March of 1898, the Daia Trail reported that an investigator on the site, Sanderson Reed, believed that the Clara Nevada had gone aground and the fire might have occurred when the lamps were tipped over spilling fiery kerosene on the interior of the ship. Reed did notice a large hole in the side of the vessel, but believed that the boiler was intact. Reed also guessed that the striking of the reef had overturned the lamps and thus caused the conflagration to erupt in different parts of the ship, making it impossible for the passengers to fight all of the fires at the same time. This corroborated the testimony by a Lloyds of London surveyor who stated that categorically that there had been no boiler explosion. Interestingly, Reed noted that there had probably been an attempt to lower lifeboats. This raised another perplexing question. If there were as many as 165 people on board, how was it that only one body was ever found? And that body, according to several newspapers, was not even in the immediate vicinity of the Clara Nevada. It was found well downwind from the ship's final resting place. Adding more mud to the water, in an article that appeared in the Dai Trail on May 7, 1898, there was the appearance of a lifeboat. A small coastal craft, the Sea Lion, spotted a boat near Seward City, about seven miles from Elder Rock. It sent a crew ashore and found an abandoned craft that was either a lifeboat or a sealing boat. There were life preservers from the Clara Nevada on board, as well as a roll of blanket containing clothes, which a Yukoner would take along with him. Another blanket roll of clothing was inside, was found about 60 yards away and close to the remains of a fire. A careful examination of the newspaper accounts of the Clare Nevada's last trip raised yet another striking question. The lifeboat that was found on shore does not match the description of any of the lifeboats which were on board. But there was one piece of evidence that burst open the doors of speculation. Comparing the names of the passengers and crew of the Clara Nevada against the 1900 census, there was one clear match, C.H. Lewis. The captain of the Clara Nevada, who had supposedly gone down with his ship, was working as a steamboat captain on a brand new steamboat on the Yukon River barely 18 months later. Then there is the question of the Clara Nevada's cargo. According to a number of sources, it was estimated that about $165,000 17 million in today's dollars, 
in untraceable raw gold had gone down with the Clara Nevada. There were a number of published sources for the statement. The first was on February 25th in the Seattle Times, which estimated the gold at about $90,000 to $120,000 in 1898 dollars. The June 5th Seattle Post and Challenger listed the gold as amounting to $100,000. Another Seattle Times article even indicated that one passenger was carrying $165,000 with him. Other articles in Seattle papers listed the amount of gold as high as $300,000. It is intriguing that the gold from the Clara Nevada was never reported found. Oddly, or perhaps purposefully, the Clara Nevada's final resting place is in 24 feet of water. Considering that the surrounding waters are 1,500 feet deep, the Clara Nevada was resting on the very tip of a submarine mountain. Would someone bent on stealing 110,000 ounces of gold know exactly where to sneak a ship so that he could return to plunder the gold raid later? Ironically, it was the Clara Nevada in her previous life as the Hassler that had surveyed these waters and perhaps planted the seed of her own destruction. The Clara Nevada is probably America's coldest cold case file. It is also the largest robbery in American history, twice the size of the Brinks job, and was the largest mass murder in American history until the bombing of the Murrah Federal Building in Oklahoma City in 1995. It also is a grim reminder that getting gold was not anywhere near as getting it home. Thanks for joining me today. Don't forget to check the show notes for links to the Author Masterminds website and Readers and Writers Book Club. You can also read more about me and my books in the show notes. If you enjoyed this podcast, don't forget to subscribe. We'll be back soon with another edition of Mysterious.